Listen, this show, this show is it right now. I know some people are put off by maybe the corniness or they, they, they probably think it's like a CW show or MTV show. And I'm telling you, this is one of Netflix's best. This is a story that's usually like the side plot in a lot of major networks, but Netflix has taken it and given it its own voice. Like we've all seen shows that are authentic, right? But they may not have like the best camera work. They're shot like a damn progressive commercial. Or maybe you've seen others where they do have characters and they're very popular, but you can tell that those minority characters are written by people who've never actually met those people in real life. This show, however, exceeds in all those boxes. I had covered season one way back when because that ending had hit hard, so the moment season two dropped, I double-checked my locks, I grabbed my jaritos, safely and securely streamed the show thanks to ExpressVPN, and bro, how is season two better than season one? Let me explain. Like I said, if you want our thoughts on season one and how I thought the show perfectly balanced comedy and drama, we already got you right here. But in terms of season two, ooh, for those who don't know, the series follows four friends in the fictional town of Free Ridge, California, where they're just going through your standard John Hughes high school drama, except for the fact that there's two rival gangs looming over them and one of the friends is forced to join. Now, I'm assuming you guys have already seen the show because I'm going to talk about it from that perspective. So if you haven't, definitely go see it so we can secondhand a lot of this conversation and just go see it and give it a try. Because what I love about the show is that you always hear about bad neighborhoods or maybe you come from one and there's always this notion that there's like only shootings that happen there. Like no one has any goals. It's just like they wake up and they wonder who they're going to shoot today. That's not how it is at all. This show actually shows their world, the friendships that they have, and just breaking down the characters, we have the main ones like Ruby, who's actually based off of one of the creators. Ruby is loosely based on me. And when you're sitting there and you're watching a show I, I, about people, about people of color, made by people of color, there's an authenticity to it. He's short, so he makes up for it with his talking, but my man's also been in Logan and the Get Down, so whenever he hits you with a move or an emotional punch, it's like, well, yeah, of course, I mean... This man's gonna go places, he's got the acting chops. And that's actually something I think for the entire cast. Uh, for those of you who have seen the movie Short Term 12 and how we look back on how that movie created so many stars, I hope we look back on, on my block, on this picture right here and go, damn, I remember when they started here. The biggest reason I think season two is better though is mainly because of Ruby's character. Like I'm sure everyone watching season one got so accustomed to the comedy, they thought it was all funny, they thought Caesar was the only one in danger, never Ruby. It just shows you the repercussions. Yo, I thought they had Ricky Ruby. The fact that it ended up being Olivia who died was sad. Um, but <laughs> look, I'm pretty sure we all preferred Ruby being alive. And then Ruby even gives her a Spanish dictionary when they visit her memorial. I'm with Ruby. The girl was many things, definitely not a linguist. Yeah, she once called Orchata. Aracha. Wasn't just once. Because of that death though, season two Ruby is having these emotional breakdowns. Almost every party is ruined because it triggers that PTSD. He's feeling survivor's guilt. He, he's more upset that his family had to feel that pain than the literal physical pain he felt. And this man kills it. That said, there was also these crazy speeches written for him that, you know, I'll be honest, didn't really work for me. I'm not saying that people can't give uh, long Gary Vee monologues, but it felt more like a writer speaking through him, if that makes any sense. Surprisingly though, for a character that talks a lot, it's the moments where he talks the least that I think hit the most. Now, Caesar's an interesting character, and the beauty of it is that it doesn't even start with him. His brother Spooky could probably lead a whole season on his own, you know, just because of the depth they've given him. And the thing about that is that we've seen Spooky before in a lot of movies. It's always the same, I, I can't even call it a character, more like a stand-in for Cholo number one. You know, shout out to actors like Cliff Curtis and Noel G who have always kind of been typecast into these roles and they never were allowed to really flesh them out. But I'm glad to see that both of these guys are now getting better roles and I'm glad to see what they did with Spooky in this season. Like, just think about it. You ever wonder how this affects people who are only seeing that portrayal of Mexicans on TV? Like, if they haven't met other Mexicans, some people are ignorant enough to think that every person just looks like that, that that's how they act. Get the hell out of there with that. When Spooky started talking about how he wanted to go to college, his perspective and the sacrifices that he's made, his loyalty and hurt when dealing with his little brother who not only let him down, but then he has to put everything on the line to save him, bro. You can tell this was written by someone who eats aguacates, 
and not just avocado toast. I know some people have brought up how the Santos are the main focus and that they kind of look down on the profits and I think that's all about perspective. I think the show is more nuanced and, and subtle to the point that I have no doubt the showrunners are going to focus in on the profits and their side in future seasons, you know? And if they do do this one thing that I love, then <laughs> I'll save it for the end of the video. Back to Caesar, he was being forced into this gang and because he didn't want to be a part of it and he decided to not do the command that was commanded of him, that mistake ends up coming back to hurt his friends and now this dude's feeling all guilty. That whole sophomore season is about him feeling unwanted because it's almost like he was predestined to be in this gang, like he never even had a choice, which is insane. Monse, which, let me check this real quick. Yeah, Monse is about to be a lot of people's crushes if she isn't already. Like, the storyline with her and Caesar was cool, right? I get it, it's cute. Everyone's still making their love montages for them on YouTube. But that storyline with her mom, though? Like, I get that the dad raised Monse, right? The dad who stayed is going through this conundrum of obviously wanting to keep his daughter, but at the same time, he knows that's selfish because this place is dangerous. But in terms of the mom, I mean, yeah, she's better than Billy Batson's, but the fact that she lies, that she's spreading all these different things after she was the one who deserted Monse, like, I hate when people lie and put other people down to hide the fact they're the scumbags, faking domestic abuse for sympathy, leaving your daughter because you don't know how genetic works. Ma'am. Oh, no. Nice. <laughs> kidding me. I'm literally trying to tell you guys something that will positively change your lives. Then there's Jamal who, bro, Jamal's wild. Like there's a scene where he eats 10 edibles this season. And I was like, isn't this man eating edibles all the time? You know, like I know a lot of people love his character. My man's just got way too much stamina for me, but he was the one who found the fabled roller world money. Um, but then I guess he lost it. So there's that. Okay. Who said Jasmine was a top three character? I, I thought my list was set and solidified, and then season two Jasmine comes in wanting to be so close to Ruby that that, that included the number one spot as well. Like, don't get me wrong. I know a lot of people with this energy, right? And I'm not giving a pass to lines like these. Does that mean? I wanna win the day. Yes, you wanna see my third nipple? But for every bad line they gave her, there were others that made me spit out my jaritos. So tell me, if you squeeze them titties hard enough, does milk come out? I don't know. Girl, and you're like a gringa, so it's like soy or like almond or some good shit like that. <laughs> and again, it's seeing her backstory that makes you love her even more. Like, we, we, we all thought she was annoying season one, and now in season two, it's like, yo, out of all the friends, she's probably the most loyal. Because to be honest, Jasmine and Jamal may be running on honeycomb cereal because they're always hyped up, but they're like the least appreciated in the group, and I'm pretty sure that's gonna come back in future seasons. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I don't even like this word. Hold on, explain. Listen, did y'all know LME almost got canceled by white people for not embracing diversity enough a couple years back? Yo, back in the A to Z days, we had made a video praising how Coco's authenticity compared to the faux diversity some other projects had, right? And that was coming from my Mexican perspective. Cause let's keep it real. We can tell when the writer actually knows what they're writing or if they're just, you know, going off stereotypes or, you know, things that they've seen before. We know that the term is now a marketing play, right? Like many don't use it because they actually care for diversity. They just know diversity means a more diverse fun. So we just gotta keep it honest. You know, it ain't everyone, but just like Oscar bait, there's most deaf diversity baiting. So to make a video expressing that and honoring a project that I thought I got it right and then having <laughs> y'all know what I'm talking about here y'all ever have white people explain your experiences to you and again for those people because I already hear them in the comments uh Caleb's the Billy's out there look if you're one of the good ones then don't say it we, we know you're one of the good ones if the shoe don't fit bro don't, don't worry about it <laughs> just leave it what I really want to focus on is the positive because we notice when the writers know nothing about the viewpoint they're writing for so hearing that these writers and day players shared similar experiences it shows. They realize that just like the show, life is a tonal shift and they went at all the aspects. Like hearing that the creator's 117 cousins helped make up all the pictures around the refrigerator is awesome. That the crew was so tight they had producers and supervisors playing extras. The damn writers were smoking it out on the set. This line about the abuelita recognizing her cobija, like, <sighs> on my block, y'all know we're watching you. Like, you know all eyes are on you. So yeah, 
When I say that the word diversity has been played out, it's because I'm so used to people approaching it in a lazy way, or, or it's fake, you know? Like JK Rowling making claims because she wants that credit but doesn't put the work in. That's why I think representation may be a better word. I even hate putting labels, but at least in representation you have to represent. They can't just be a cardboard cutout. And in this show I'm glad to say, they never are. Now, I've heard the weirdest thing in terms of that cliffhanger ending. To me, it has to be something big. Like, the creators said they knew how season one was going to end because they had it all planned out. And it's true, season one's ending resonated throughout all of season two. So this one can't be something like, oh, they just got kidnapped for a birthday party. Uh, no, it's got to be something that really affects them throughout all of season three. I personally have faith that it will. I've heard theories that, <laughs> I've heard theories of some people saying it's Olivia's parents coming back for revenge. And I'm like... <laughs> What, what do you what do you mean? I'm pretty sure it has to do with the roller world money, but in terms of other theories, I do believe Chivo may be Lil Ricky who left the gang to start a new life. I do believe Caesar's fling is gonna come back to be a pregnant plot point that we're gonna see, and I definitely think we're gonna see more from the Prophet's perspective. My hope, of course, is that they focus a little bit more on Latrell's arc. Obviously, it's gonna take some time, but. Yo, just think about this idea. Like, in season 5, Latrell is a part of the crew. He's like won them over, like they've all gotten along. That'd be something that's so crazy, not just because of the message that it would send, but that idea of going back to season 1 and not being able to fathom that he used to be the quote-unquote bad guy. I love when shows build characters like that. The creators have stated that Monse is going to be playing an even bigger role in the future, and I could definitely see her leaving for a couple of episodes, still covering her at the boarding school and all that stuff, but then coming back because obviously she wouldn't leave her friends. I also love how the creators of the show look at the characters sort of like in seasons, like, like I was talking about with Jasmine. She was annoying in season one, but then after everything you learn about her in season two, you look at her differently, and I'm, I'm wondering who else we're going to learn more of and then see them differently if we were to re watch the episodes. You know, there's also the idea that Monza's mom right now may be a bad influence, but who knows what the future holds. It's really building up on that idea that the movie Blindspotting hit on, where you don't judge someone for one thing or, or think that they're bound to it, but that people can change or perspectives, you know, are sometimes not what they seem. And the show's doing that outside of its characters. You know, anytime anyone talks about the hood, the ghetto, the inner city, there's the notion that nothing good comes out of there, that all the kids are bad, but they're not. We've just rarely shared their stories. We didn't realize that portraying only the negative is exactly what breeds it back. That the black story was being told from people, probably not from it. And why I believe those telling it authentically should be praised for making a difference. You know, I used to get on camera and talk about street shit. Right. Or talk about gang culture. Right. And then I get to my show and everybody want to show me that they hard. And everybody fighting in the crowd and shooting up the parking lot. And so I'm like, damn, you know, I'm 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 putting out an energy through these interviews or through this conversation I'm having on camera that's bringing it. It's it's showing back up in my show. So that's when I decided I'm gonna I'm gonna speak what I want to see. And I start talking about business. And I oh, start yeah. speaking about opportunity and speaking about progress and optimism. And I saw that come back to me also. Thank you guys for watching this video and a big shout out to ExpressVPN. You know, we're super grateful for the sponsors that we get on this channel because not only does it help it, but they also push us to cover stories like these, which like, you don't even realize how that's one of the best parts. Like, we respect that a lot. In 2019, you're going to need protection from everything, especially when you're online. And out of all the VPNs we've tried, trust us, if there was a better one, you'd be seeing their name here instead. We use it a lot for streaming because it has the fastest speeds. It's on every app, which is dope since we're watching one episode on the TV, then on the tablet, then on the computer. And with all the tickets we're buying online for movies, it keeps our cards secure from all the freaking Marvel hackers trying to swap up our endgame tickets. It's less than $7 a month and the best part is the 30-day guarantee because you know if someone isn't giving you that 30-day guarantee they're probably bamboozling you so if you go to expressvpn.com slash let me explain you can find out how to get three months free so you can protect yourself online as you wait for season three of on my block but just know um <laughs> it ain't gonna protect your computer from crumbs like monza is what like 
Monse, what were you thinking? Other than that, I'm curious to know your guys' thoughts down below in the comment section. Uh, which season do you like more? I obviously love season two way more than season one, but that's like, that's not a bad thing. That's the way it was set up to be, and you, they're saying season three is going to be better. I'm excited for it. Let me know what your favorite character is, your theories on what's going to happen, all that good stuff down below, anything else you want us to cover. And remember, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and we'll send you the Roller World money your way.